Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, it's just bad news. So many good news, but not today. Deadlines say that all along. Uh, exam number one, quizzes part two. Deadline five in a day, lunch to 9 to 9 p.m. on October 16th. Exam number two, quizzes part three. Deadline November 13th, also in the day. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four. Deadline December 4th. And exam number five, the exciting final. Deadlines on December 11th, Friday of finals week at noon. For the paper, if you want to do a draft, deadline is number 16th, and you can do as many drafts as you want until either you get the grade you want, yay, or you just can stick to the process, or time runs out. Plus five deadline is November 18th, now turn it on Blackboard for full credit, deadline November 25th, and half credit deadline December 4th. Also, as mentioned before, on uh, Monday, I've got uh, jury duty, so no office hours, no class. I've got uh, videos posted that cover the material that we we're normally talked about on Monday. And as soon as I know whether I'm jurying or not, I'll put in an announcement so people will know what to do or not do. Before pressing on to the new stuff, more of Aristotle's virtue stuff, anything about the stuff to be, or the stuff that has been, or other stuff that needs more stuff. Okay. So last time we're having exciting adventures in the regress reductio argument. And we talked about two types of regresses. And we saw the first one, kind of the simplest of the two, is the circular regress. And that's the, an example of this would be the classic, in order to get a job, you got to have experience. But in order to have experience, you got to have a job. And it would run a person in a circle so they can never get either. At least if the circle was unbreakable. We also looked at the infinite regress, in which the first step in a series of steps would require an infinite number of steps to be achieved. And I gave the example of the evil bureaucrat who, you know, trying to get financial aid, and for every form, there's another form you have to fill out to get that form. So you'll never get your financial aid. Now in terms of the reductio part, here's how the reductio part works. Back in the ancient days, at the start of the semester, we were talking about the argument types, and we saw the reductio ad absurdum. And there's kind of two flavors. One is, if you want to prove that something's not true, you assume it's true, and from that assumption, derive something that's a contradiction, or absurd, or impossible. And that would show that it would be untrue. If you want to show that something is true, you assume it's not true, and then from that assumption, derive something that is absurd, impossible, or a contradiction, or is otherwise problematic, and then draw the appropriate conclusion. So how does our good day for Harris level make it happen with the reductio? Well, what he does is this. What he wants to do is try to show that there is some supreme good, ultimate good, that is the end of all the things we do. And of course, that's the big H, happiness. So what he says is this. Suppose each thing we, we do is for some other end. So for example, you go um, to high school to get into college. You go to college to graduate and get your degree. You get your degree to get a job. You get your job to get money. You get your money to get stuff, and more stuff, and more stuff, and more stuff, and then you're done. Now Aristotle claims that if everything we do is aimed at some other end, and there's not an ultimate end, everything would be pointless and ineffectual. In other words, we'd be kind of like a hamster in a wheel, going, 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 but going nowhere. So we'd never, you know, there'd be no point. We'd never achieve, you know, a worthwhile goal. Now, this, according to Aristotle, shows that having no ultimate goal, by showing that life would be pointless and ineffectual, he takes that as a reductio because he believes that life does have a point. So there's got to be some ultimate end, supreme good, that stops that. So his claim is, 
all the stuff we do ultimately aims towards happiness. So we go to school, you know, to get the you know the degree, to get the job, and to get the money, to get the stuff. But all that aims, according to Aristotle, at least, at an ultimate goal of happiness. Now, just because Aristotle argued that and he used you know regress and reductio doesn't mean he's right, because he thinks this shows convincingly there is some ultimate end that gives life purpose. A person could reply back to that saying, well, there is no end to the regress, there is no point. We are all just, you know, hamsters running in a wheel, going nowhere fast. So that would be an alternative. But Aristotle thinks there is an ultimate good, the happiness. So to his satisfaction, he has established dun, 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 that there is a supreme good, or so he thinks. Now, if he's right, and of course he may not be, we would need to know what this good is, supreme good, for the obvious reason that if we know what we're aiming for, we're much more likely to, to hit it. And so what he's going to try to do is lay out what is this good? What life should we pursue in order to achieve it? Now, happiness, of course, is assumed to be the supreme good. But of course, happiness, as presented that way, is just a word. We need to know what it is. And to develop it, to try to give an answer, he considers three types of lives. And he throws in a fourth as a bonus. So it's four for the price of three. And these are the life of pleasure, the life of honor, or fame, if you want to modernize it a bit, the contemplated, the philosophical life, and the fourth bonus one is what we consider the economic life, making the money. So he first considers the life of pleasure. This is a life aimed at, well, as it says, achieving physical pleasures, mental pleasures too, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all that stuff. Now, Aristotle is first kind of elitist and dismissive about pleasure as the highest good, because he's critical of the masses and says, you know, the masses, the many, they're basically like cows, just seeking pleasure like animals. But he says certain, you know, well-known figures such as uh, Sardanapalus are you know, people who seek pleasure, but are not of the masses. I mean, today we would use an example of, uh, you know, like people who are celebrities and superstars who live lives of, lives of decadence and pleasure. So he says, okay, we can kind of consider this. But he gives two arguments as to why pleasure is not the same thing as happiness. First argument is this. And this will appear again uh, later when we talk about um, utilitarianism with our good dead friend John Stuart Mill. He raises what you know is called later the pig objection. And it goes like this. If we take pleasure to be the highest good, that is saying the life of a beast, the life of raw animal pleasures, food, you know, sex, etc is the highest life. But clearly, he says, that's mistaken. The greatest life for a human is not the life of a pig, not the life of a beast or an animal. And again, this will rear its beastly head when you talk about utilitarianism. But again, kind of the gist of it is, what is the highest good? It's supposed to be something noble and exalted, worthy of humanity. And just running around and, you know, eating, not good enough. You said that the four types of life, pleasure, life, and fame, and two others are... Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, pleasure, fame, slash honor, the contemplative, the philosophical life, and the fourth one is... Economic. Um, yeah, economic. The life of wealth. Looking for the, for the money. Or pretty much the life we all have to lead uh, these days. And we've got to work for that living. Well, most of us. So... First argument is pleasure is the, you know, the beast or pig objection, that pleasure is not the highest, exalt, most exalted good, so not happiness. The second argument is this. Happiness is what we're supposed to like achieve 
as sort of our serious goal. It is, he contends, the highest and greatest goal. Pleasure, he says, is something that's more, you know, trivial. And the idea that we should, you know, devote our existence, our, all our serious efforts just to pleasure seems childish and immature. You know, to just sort of be, you know, you can think of it as kind of like if someone said, well, the highest goal in life is just to, you know, eat a lot of good food, you do a lot of good drugs. Party. Yeah, party, party, party. Yeah. We'd say, well, you know, that's good for a while, but should not be the, you know, the ultimate. It's not a career, as you know, parents would often say. It's not a career. So we could say that it's too trivial, too lacking in seriousness to be the ultimate goal. Or so he claims. So he says, it's not pleasure. Now, he doesn't just throw pleasure away, because it may seem kind of odd to say, okay, okay, I get just, you know, feeling pleasure, probably not the highest goal, you know, really can't make a career out of that, but yeah, it's pretty good. And Aristotle would agree. He'd say, yeah, that's pretty good. And he does say that happiness, that pleasure is part of happiness, kind of an ingredient, kind of like, um, well, I'll use a crappy analogy. It's kind of like, think of cake. Sugar is not cake, but sugar is part of cake. And in fact, it's critical. Cake is a vehicle for delivering frosting. So you don't, you don't get that shameful eating out of the frosting out of the can. I have done that. I have been, everyone's done it. But you, get, you know, if you have a little shame, you put it on the cake, you know, at least in public. The can is for private, eating the frosting out of the, out of the can in private. Good stuff, good stuff. So life of pleasure, is out. Secondly, he considers the life of honor. Now, the Greeks, like pretty much everybody, were very political people, you know, and so one of the things that one would aim for if one was sort of an ambitious Greek would be the life of honor, the political life, having a position in society. And of course, you know, we still have this today. People, you know, we have a lot of people running for president. Now we can also, of course, to sort of modernize and bring it up to the 21st century, we can also include here like the life of, you know, fame, being, you know, recognized, famous, being a celebrity. You know, it could be a celebrity in, you know, we think of like actors, musicians, artists, athletes, but people also aim for, you know, status in others, like in their jobs, in academics, to be kind of a superstar. So he kind of you know, modernizes this a bit to the life of faith. Now, Aristotle says, well, again, he gives a couple of arguments as to why honor or fame is not the supreme good. One reason is this. He claims that the supreme good is something proper to the you know, holder of that good. It's not something that's easily taken away. And it's not something that you have to depend entirely on others to give you. Now, when it comes to, well, we'll use fame, because honor is kind of, a, these days, you know, kind of seen as kind of outdated. We'll use fame in its place. Now, for the most part, if you're famous, who does your fame depend on? Fame is. <clears throat> yeah. Everybody else that makes you famous. It's... And I mean, some people, you might say, kind of earn their fame. You know, they do things that are of great merit. But typically, you know, think of like being going viral on YouTube. There's all kinds of stuff of very high quality that never goes, you know, viral. It depends on other people. So your fa being famous depends on everyone else staring at you, you know, and paying attention and talking about you. And so Aristotle thinks uh, that depends too much on other people conferring it. So it can't be the supreme good. It'd be too, too unreliable. Now, the second argument he gives is this: that people often, you know, seek honor to convince themselves and others that they are just or good. Now, you can also turn this around a little bit and say, well, people seek fame not just for the sake of fame, but to convince others, convince themselves that they are really. You know, great. Because, you know, with most people, you know, if they thought they were famous really for just nothing, with no merit, I mean, sure, that's awesome, but they probably want to be, you know, have something behind it, the feeling that it's kind of 
earned. Although being famous just for being famous makes a lot of money sometimes. So Aristotle says, well, people typically seek you know, honor so to convince themselves or others of their justice, their goodness. And so he considers that. Is having justice or being you know, good, is that happiness? And here he takes a shot at his teacher, Plato. As we'll see when we get to uh, part three, talking about the ring of Gages, Plato, speaking through the character of Socrates, says that the highest life is being good, and that this would be, you know, one would be happy, even in the most terrible of circumstances. And Aristotle says, no one can seriously do that unless they are defending a paradox. It's basically saying to Plato, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Now, Aristotle was kind of cool about it, because he said that he loved Plato, but he loved the truth more, which is either like cool or kind of passive aggressive. <laughs> Maybe both. So he says that you could be a just person, but be suffering terribly. I mean, for example, think of you know, famous historical figures who were people who were just and good, and they were tortured and thrown in jail and tortured more, and then perhaps you know, finally executed. And we probably wouldn't say, you know, were they happy? We'd probably say, well, no, being in jail and having their like, eyes pulled out and then you know, killed by being set on fire or something, probably not a lot of happiness there. But we'd still say they were a good person. So it makes sense to say someone is just, but they're really unhappy. So he says, it's not honor, it's not justice, so that's out. Now, he doesn't say that honor is bad or justice is bad, it's just it's not happiness. Because you could you know, have justice and you could be suffering terrible claims. Now, of course, some people would counter that. So they would say that if you truly are just, even in the worst circumstances, you would still be happy. So if those are out, well, he also considers um, wealth. And he dismisses this pretty quickly. He basically says, well, there's already been a lot of published works saying that wealth is not happiness. Which he doesn't, you know, which he doesn't include here, but we could say, you know, argue from authority. Now, probably the best argument against wealth being the good is that, kind of like with the justice thing, could someone have lots and lots of wealth and be unhappy? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're told that, you know, money can't buy happiness, which is true. You can only rent it. And if you have enough money, you can keep renting it until you die. But yeah, someone, you know, someone could have a great deal of wealth and still be very unhappy. I mean, of course, then there's, you know, classic stories designed to teach us that. You know, King Midas, who loved gold more than anything, and so he was given what he thought was a great power, turning everything to gold that he touched. But, of course, the moral of the story is everything, you know, he touches like all his food, he can't eat, he touches his family, and so he learns that gold is not the highest happiness thing. Never figured out, you know, put on some gloves or something. But anyways, work around it. I guess that's a cheat. Yeah, I guess that's a cheat, you know, put on the gloves so he can't touch stuff. Now, so he considers that to be not well. Now, there are people who can make the objection. They could say, no. Wealth is happiness. Happiness is fat stacks of cash, which would be you know, a fair point to make. Is wealth, is it the same thing as happiness? And we think perhaps not, because you could have like lots and lots of wealth, but still not be happy. <coughs> now interestingly, leaping, you know, taking aside from Aristotle, what is the amount of money in the US you have to have to be happy? There's actually a number they found. I don't know, I'll spend like $50 a day. So. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> now they found that apparently it's $70,000. Uh, if somebody has that income, the people, they, they found that people did not report any higher level of happiness. I mean, people do report, you know, they can get more stuff, but that's kind of the, the point, you know, at least now in the United States, at which people say that's, that's enough. So it's not that the wealth makes them happy, it's considered to be kind of the level you need to, you know, to be secure. And that way you're not, you know, you, you feel monetarily confident. 
So apparently there is a monetary level for what people claim to be happiness. And when people get way beyond that, their happiness does not, does not increase. I mean, it gives you more opportunities. At least that's what they claim. Of course, it could be a lot to make us feel, you know, that, oh, okay, I just need 70000 and I'm set. And of course, the average income in America is way less than 70000 which probably explains why most people are on, in part, why most people aren't happy. So when you're picking your job, make sure you hit that figure and make sure you adjust for inflation. <laughs> so what he's going to try to do, since none of these work, he needs to find out what is the good for man, or to be non-sexist, what is the good for humans. And so to answer that, he takes sort of a, um, well, kind of like a loop, like a you know, roundabout. And we're getting, <coughs> in fact, we're getting a roundabout down on um, where railroad is. There's going to be a nice little roundabout there, which is why if you're planning on driving that railroad today, you won't be able to do it. Well, you can, but you'll hit the construction. But he gives a second argument for the good, which kind of repeats the first one. He essentially tries to say, argue, argue that there is an ultimate end, and the final end is the most supreme of all these ends. So what he needs to do is try to show why is this happiness. And as I mentioned, Aristotle, the Greek, argues every single point. So at this point, you might think, OK, Aristotle, we, we accept it's happiness. Can we move on? He says, no, <laughs> I have more arguments. So here is three arguments why happiness is the final end. As I say, it's the ultimate, you know, the thing, the goal, what we do all our stuff to ultimately achieve. First argument is choice. He claims that all that we do, all that we choose, is for the sake of happiness. That we could. Sorry, um, so the wealth and the economic was not. Yeah, he, he, he rejects it. One argument he gives is kind of an argument from authority. He says many arguments have been published right. against this. But probably the best one is, is that wealth we typically see as a need. So you get, you get wealth in order to get other stuff. And that a person, and another argument people commonly use is, you could have wealth, but not be happy. And if wealth was happiness, then having wealth would make you happy. You just need to pile, pile up money to guarantee happiness. And Aristotle rejects that. Now, now of course, to be fair, just because Aristotle you know, makes an argument, just because other people made the argument, doesn't mean they're right. Perhaps the highest good is well, and if you just stack up enough cash, you'll achieve happiness. But you can do that as an empirical thing. Start stacking up cash, see if you feel better. <laughs> okay, make it for heading along. Now, the choice argument works like this. He says that we choose all that we do as a means towards happiness. So if you ask someone like why you're doing that, the ultimate answer would tie into happiness. Now you might think, well, what if it's something the person doesn't really like to do? You know, like say like you know, work on their job or something. But you could of course, you know, make a tail that connects that. You work the job to get money, and you get money to buy like food so you don't die. <laughs> And so that attributes and you moves you towards the end of happiness because you're not like dead. But here's how the choice argument itself goes. And I'll present it as kind of a um, language argument. Suppose somebody says to you, I decided to learn how to draw because I thought it would make me happier. Or a person says that they divorced their spouse who was cheating on them because they thought it would make them happier. Do those Statements make, make sense. I mean, you might not agree with them, but do they, do they make sense? It's a sensible thing to say. Sure, why not? Now, what if someone says this? I made myself happy so that I could learn to draw. Or I made myself happy so I could get divorced. Or I made myself happy so I could go back to school. Or I made myself, I made myself happy so I could drink some wine. Would that make like, a lot of sense? 
I guess to them. Yeah, but they would sound kind of mean. Suppose someone, if you saw someone like doing something, and you asked them, what are you doing? And they said, I'm making myself happy so that I might drink wine. You would probably say, wow, there's something, <laughs> something weird about this person. You know, backing away slowly, <laughs> not making sudden moves. Yeah, so in a way to say like, I make myself happy to go to school, or I make myself happy to, do, to go to work, we would say, well, that doesn't really make sense. We do so, it makes sense to say, I go to work to make money because I think this will ultimately lead to happiness, or I married this person because I thought it would make myself happy. Those things make sense. We choose things for happiness. And so Aristotle seems to be right. Now, this might be language, you know, just the way language works, but it has some plausibility. Second argument is the self-sufficiency argument. He claims that happiness is self-sufficient. That is to say, if you've got it, you've got all you know, the good that you need. That it's you know, self-contained, so to speak. Now, for Aristotle, happiness is not like a simple thing. So it's not like you go and get like a, you know, like a ball of happiness or a jar of happiness full of 100% like pure happiness. He sees it as kind of a complicated thing. You know, to use a crappy analogy, it's kind of like this. Um, you can buy, like, a cake, but there's no such thing as, you know, cake, a simple thing. It's not like cake, you know, cake, elemental cake. The cake is made of other stuff, you know, sugar, flour, eggs, you know, water, frosting, etc. And, of course, there are different types of cakes. And so for Aristotle, happiness is kind of a complicated thing. But his claim is, is that happiness is something that is self-sufficient. When you've got it, you, that fulfills your, your needs, so he claims. And he says other stuff is not self-sufficient. You need more stuff. Now, he's not saying you can like, live on happiness and breathe happiness, but it means in terms of your, you know, your goodness, your end, final end, happiness is self-sufficient. Once you achieve that, you achieve the goals, or so we could. The final one is the most desirable argument for happiness. And his claim is basically here that being the most desirable thing, that the way you kind of test that is, you'd ask, does adding something to it, would that make it like more desirable? Now suppose you had perfect happiness as like a prize. Would it be something you could add into that that would make it, like, better. Not really if it's already perfect. Yeah, I mean, if it is, if you had ultimate happiness, that would pretty much, you know, do it. If someone said, oh, I'm holding out for something, something better than perfect happiness, I want to say as well, there's nothing more, there's nothing better than that. It's the best, it's the best stuff. Now, again, all these are, you know, arguments, kind of reasonable, but they could all be, be countered. So at this point, we can say to Aristotle, Okay, for the sake of argument, at the very least, we'll accept happiness is the supreme good. But we still haven't settled what it is. If Aristotle's right, it's not pleasure, although that's part of it. It's not honor, it's not wealth. So what is it? Well, his attempt to answer the question basically is this. He's going to look at the function of man, or if we want to be non-sexist, the function of humans. And he thinks, as I mentioned before, we talked about teleology, that all things have a function, including us. Now, being Aristotle, he, of course, wants to argue for that. And he gives two arguments, both of which are, yeah, can be criticized. First one is this. It's an argument by analogy. He says, if we look at, you know, professions, like, you know, carpenter, web designer, you know, race car driver, they all have functions. The function of the NASCAR driver is to drive. The function of the you know, hunter is to hunt. The, hunter, the function of the web designer is to design the webs, to you know, do that stuff. And he says, well, if all these professions have functions, surely nature would not leave humans deprived of a function. Now, of course, that can be seen as a bad argument, because you could say, well, yeah, you know, it's one thing to have a job that is a function, because that's what jobs are, but why should we infer that nature basically gives us you know, a job, so to speak? The second argument he gives for the function is this. 
as he points out, all our parts have a function. You know, the liver filters out toxins. The uh, kidneys also filter out stuff. The heart pumps, pumps blood. Uh, the spleen stores extra blood. The eyes see, you know, the ears hear. And so all our parts do something. They have functions. So he, he concludes that if all our parts have functions, then the whole thing must have a function as well. Now, this does have a certain appeal. You know, if you have, say, like a, you know, a phone and all the parts do something, you might say, well, the whole thing does something, too. It would be weird to have something that has every part has a function, but the whole thing is functions. Now, he could be criticized, though, for doing what's called the fallacy of composition. A fallacy is, as we saw in the ancient days of you know, week one, a mistaken reason, a bad argument which the premises do not adequately support the conclusion. And the fallacy of composition is when someone uncritically assumes that what's true of the parts must be true of the whole. So for example, if someone says, oh, this team has the best players, all these superstars, so it's the best team. Now, it is not unreasonable to think that a team of the best players might be really good, but of course, best players doesn't guarantee best team. Because you have a team whose players are not, as, not the best, but they are the best team because they played, you know, they're not as great individually, like in terms of shooting and so forth, and they work together much better. So maybe Aristotle's making that, making that mistake. That may be true that every one of our parts has a function, but the whole entity doesn't. We have no function. But he thinks we do. So then, if assuming we get a function, we gotta figure out what is it? What it is that we do? Now, for Aristotle, he's looking for kind of our defining function because everything does like a lot of stuff. And the question is not, you know, what is everything that it does, but what is it that it does that's, you know, special? I mean, to use kind of an example, you know, phones, they occupy space and time. They are a certain color and size. They do all that stuff. But the function of a phone is not to you know, be in space or time, its function is to make calls. That's its special deal. Because, you know, bricks and so forth and rocks and tables also exist, you know, in space and time. <laughs> so one thing we do, of course, is we're alive. Yeah, still alive. And so, but the question is, is that our special deal, our special function? And the answer is, well, no. Because things like plants and fungi and toads and llamas and squirrels are alive too. That's not our special deal. Next he considers uh, sentient life, feeling. But of course animals, you know, cats and dogs and lemurs and llamas, they feel, they seem to have, you know, emotions and feelings like we do. So that's not our special deal. So what do we got that other stuff doesn't got? That's our special deal. But what he claims is, is rational being rational. So our special deal is we're rational beings. And Aristotle defined, you know, humans as rational animals, which is what separates us from horses. Also the saddle does that as well. So for him, our function is to be rational. Now the function of something, and seems reasonable, is also what you use to determine whether it's you know, good at what it's doing. For example, if you're asked to assess something, you know, is this a good whatever or not, the obvious question would be is, well, what's it supposed to do? So for example, a screwdriver is a poor hammer, but it's a good screwdriver. A hammer is, you know, good at pounding the nails, but not a good, you know, screwdriver. So you want to know what is it going to do to tell if it's good or bad at it. And for Aristotle, our function is to be rational. So for him, the contemplative life, thinking, is our proper function. Or so he Now, of course, Aristotle's a philosopher, so it should hardly be surprising that, hey, guess what? 
being a philosopher is the best, <laughs> the best and proper life. Now, so that's what he gets to. So what is our proper function? Being rational. So then a good question is, so if we buy that, which we may not, how are we going to acquire this <coughs> happiness stuff? Which is a very good question, because if we accept that happiness is the supreme end, that's the ultimate goal of life, the universe, and everything, we want to know how do we get that. I mean, kind of use the analogy, if we're, you know, we know that money is pretty important, and so we want to know how to get some of that money stuff. So how do we acquire happiness? Well, he considers three options. One is divine dispensation, gift from the gods. But he says, if it's from the gods, divine dispensation, that's a subject, really not arguing against it, but he says it's a subject for another discipline, you know, theology. Next he considers, it might be the result of study and training. You, know, you can learn it through habituation. Now, as we'll see when you get to moral education, he doesn't think you can like read books and become good just by studying it intellectually, but his view is, is the way you acquire it is basically training. You become habituated, you know, his argument is you become what you <coughs> do. It's like to be is to do, to do is to be, do be do be do, and scooby do, of course. Nothing to do with Aristotle, but it just sounds funny. Now, he also considers the possibility is just chance, random. You know, some people are happy because of luck. Like, it's kind of like fame. You know, why did Fifty Shades of Grey become like a great bestseller in a movie when there are thousands and millions of better books? They could say just blind luck, just pure chance. And it's a, you know, it's a good question. You know, success in life, is that is that something you can achieve you know, through skill and effort? And that, as the American dream says, just through working hard, you can achieve it. Or is there a lot of chance involved? And the same with you know happiness. Is happiness that you can you can work towards and achieve as a goal with a decent chance of success, or is it just you know like playing craps where it's just the roll of the dice? Now Aristotle rejects chance. Good question being on what grounds? Well, that's what he claims. Aristotle again thinks that the universe is a purposeful universe. You know, is teleology. The universe has a goal, function, purpose, end. And he thinks that happiness is the finest of things, our greatest supreme good. And he thinks it would be, well, roughly put, it just wouldn't be right if the greatest and finest thing was the result of chance. It would be a gross disharmony. Or put, you know, kind of in formal terms, that just wouldn't be fair. It just wouldn't be right if the best thing was distributed by chance. Now, just because Aristotle says it, of course, doesn't mean that he's right. It, it's an open and important question. Is happiness something we can acquire through our own efforts with a decent chance of success, or does it rest very heavily on chance, randomness? You know, where you're born, who your parents are, how your life goes, whether you avoid getting hit by you know, a truck or not, all kinds of factors. Which is a really good question. Is happiness in our fate in general under our control, or is it just a random universe? Now, Aristotle thinks that happiness is not just up to us. Now, our view typically, like as Americans, and Westerners in general, we think that happiness is something we can pursue. In fact, the Declaration of Independence says pursue of happiness, but we don't see, you know, the, we talk about the government providing for the, you know, securing the common good, but there's not a, like a promise that the government's going to try to make you happy. Aristotle, though, thinks that it actually is the job of the government to make you happy. Now, by this, he doesn't mean that it's a job of the government to, like, amuse you to provide bread and circuses, to entertain, etc. 
what he thinks is that it's the duty, the objective of political science, to make the citizens good. Because he thinks that if we are good, we will become happy. So he thinks that the state is obligated to make people happy, but again, by this he doesn't mean you know, providing bread and circuses and entertainment. He means it's to make us into good people. And when we're virtuous, we will be happy. So the objective of the state is to make us excellent and lead to happiness. Now, this, as we'll see later, or actually you'll see it in the video because, again, uh, jury duty on, on Monday. But one of the objections against virtue theory is that it is oppressive, that you would have the state forcing people to be good. Now, we usually look at that as a bad thing because we think of the state just saying it's making people happy. You know, that we, we think of like the state is actually evil and it's actually up to no good. You know, a bad state claiming to make us good, but it's really like, you know, it's like George Orwell's 1984. Or like the dystopic, you know, like the Hunger Games and other dystopian films where the government says, oh, we're doing the, the best for our citizens, but it's all wrong. Now, Aristotle would say, yeah, that would be awful. If you got a state that just says, oh, yeah, we're doing the best and they're really, they're really horrible, that would be totally against his view. He thinks the state has to genuinely be doing good. So saying, well, what about evil states that pretend to be good? Well, that's like someone saying, you know, medicine, doctors should be treating patients with, you know, proper medicine. And someone says, well, what about bad doctors who use, you know, poison? Well, they'd say, well, not, that's not a problem with medicine. That's a problem with bad, bad doctors. So what then is this virtue going to be? What's what he claims? The virtue of a thing is its excellence. And the excellence of a thing is to fully be what it is. I mean, the army used to have the saying, be all you can be. And, you know, it's Gary and Aristotle's law. The idea is true excellence is fully being what you are, achieving human excellence. And that would be virtue. Now, how do you tell when something is virtuous or not? Well, Aristotle lays out that the mark of virtue is doing you know, things in the right way, the right time, towards the right people, for the right reason. And so it's really difficult. You gotta get everything right. Also feel the right way to the right degree. And a key part of this for Aristotle is, well, something we saw with Confucius, the me. And so in terms of how you're supposed to be, Aristotle's answer is, again, the Goldilocks thing. They said the kind of standard for virtue theory is, like with the tale of Goldilocks, not too much, not too little, but just right. So for Aristotle, the deal is basically to aim for that mean. So a good question would be, how would this work? And in our remaining four minutes, I'll go through a couple quick examples. Now, for Aristotle, again, in general, the virtue is going to be between excess, too much, and deficiency, too little, and it's going to be within the mean. Now, Aristotle, being a practical kind of philosopher, he's aware that you know, this is like a range. And so kind of the idea is, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, driving. You may not be able to hold like dead exactly in the middle of your lane, but you want to stay within the, the lines. Or similarly like with, you know, flying. You want to avoid hitting, hitting the ground. So you want to sort of stay within that, that range. And illustrated, he goes through many particulars. And I won't go through, because you know, it's sake of time, won't go through all of them, but here's a couple of illustrations. One would be, you know, bravery. Is there such a thing as being excessively brave, too brave? Or a person is too fearless? I guess it depends on the situation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, where someone says, looks at, the, looks at like a bear and says, I'm not afraid of no bear. I think I can take it. 
or people who aren't afraid of like you know heights and dangerous stuff. They, you, you might have known people. You might know people like that who are just they're just not afraid of stuff. And sometimes they are fine. Other times, you know, it ends bad. Yeah. So excessive, you know, foolhardiness leads to trouble, getting oneself and others hurt or or killed. And of course, there's also deficiency, too little. And if we call excessiveness, you know, foolhardy, someone with too little bravery is a you know, a coward, and that's you know bad. And the idea for Aristotle is, you know, the middle ground, not too much. You know, so you're doing crazy, dangerous stuff needlessly, but not too little. So you're not terrified of things you shouldn't be afraid of. And so the idea is to get the bravery, you know, in the in the middle middle ground. And again, it's kind of a range. Another example, I'm going to close with this is anger. Is there such a thing as being too angry? Yes, it is. Yeah, and that leads to a lot of trouble. People over, I mean, good examples would be, uh, you know, when road rage was like really getting the news. Someone cut someone off, you know, they pull a handgun out of their, their glove box, and, you cut me off. And, you know, being cut off annoys me, but death is probably not the right punishment for cutting someone off. You know, usually the proper punishment is, you know, flipping them off or, or just thinking bad thoughts about them and then doing a nasty Facebook po post about the person who, who cut you off. That seems to be just. <laughs> Now, of course, is there such a thing as being, having too little anger? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's rare. But there are some people who don't, you know, they're too calm. And they don't. They're hard to provoke. And so... Hmm? Could you give an example? Um, yeah. Actually, me. I have... I've only been angry seven times as an adult. Because... It takes a whole bunch to provoke me, for real. I am. I think it's running. I'm just like super calm, and people, you know, will try sometimes. I don't know why. It's like it's like I don't know why they want to go digging for that. But uh, there are things that I probably should be angry about occasionally, but I'm usually not. I'm just yeah. I'm not stupid. I I'm not like an idiot, but I don't get you know provoked. I don't get mad about stuff, and I have some other thing that I'm too too calm. And, you know, one thing, one disadvantage, like not being, not having that anger, is people are less like, I guess, afraid, so to speak. So if you don't have like an angry response, people often. One unfortunate thing is I found that sometimes people will push me. You know, they don't get a response, so they keep pushing. So I guess one day, in a way, not responding can be negative because people keep, keep pushing. But again, it's it's fairly rare. But like I said, my own, I'm an example of this. I I've only been angry seven times as an adult. And I mean, I, get, I have like an abstract anger, anger at injustice and so forth, but it takes a lot to provoke me. And I, I, I suspect that I probably don't have you know, enough, enough anger. But then Aristotle does raise the point about, well, you know, if you get a choice between being too angry or not too angry, there's no police report that reads, the person wasn't angry enough, and then body started hanging on the floor. It's always like, and the person went nuts and then you know, so I guess if you've got to give you one way or the other, that's probably the better, the better way. On the uh, video for Monday, mm -hmm. can you um, just revisit the uh, the first illustration about uh, the bravery? Can you um, redo that? Um, I can try if I get, if I get the time. Uh, yeah. But send me an email to remind me, because I I forget things. Okay, so then we're going to send the stuff for today, uh, Monday.